Do you know what I am? My punishment for dropping out of med school. This movie is a complete disappointment. And I should know because it takes one to know one. Matter of fact, that was my childhood nickname. Thanks, Mom and Dad. I remember when I first heard that this movie was coming out, I was hyped. Harley Quinn has always been one of my all-time favorite Batman characters. And it was nice to finally see her front and center in a movie. Mind you, this was back in 2017, so this was long before the oversaturation of Harley Quinn in every DCEU film that is planned in the foreseeable future. And to hear that this was a new addition to the Bruce, Tim, and Paul Dini universe? Uh, yeah, sign me up. Take my money. Do you need my social? I worked for a Best Buy at the time, and I was stoked to be able to buy this right after my shift so I could go home and give it a watch. So I rushed home, watched it, and instant buyer's remorse. I will give this movie this. It's not nearly as bad as I remembered it being the first time around watching it. Hell, I even put this on, and me and my friends actually had a laugh or two watching this. But this movie is just strangely inconsistent and totally all over the place. I think it also somehow suffers from the DCEU's format, that being a complete lack of an actual format and things just happen because... reference... or because... well, just because. But it's not nearly as bad. I'm sorry, I don't care what you say, I will never like Batman v Superman, it was a betrayal. To give credit to Batman and Harley Quinn, this movie isn't all, all over the place. If that makes any sense, maybe it doesn't. I just came off watching this for the sixth time so I could review it, so my brain is mush. There actually is a story here, but at times it feels a little bit abstract. You kinda gotta squint your eyes and stand on your head to really really see and get a feel for what's going on here. This movie plays out like someone watched the original Batman the Animated Series and then thought, I mean, yeah, it's good, but can we make it more fan service -y? Have you ever heard of Rule 34? So with that being said, let's get right into it, because I'm already upset. The movie starts off with introducing us to the main villains, Poison Ivy and the Floronic Man. <laughs> Here. It's Dink, man. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the power of THC. This is Reefer Madness on another level. A pairing that makes a whole lot of sense. It's good to see these two tree huggers on the same page again. Although, I think we all remembered what happened the last time Ivy and Woodrue worked together in a DC film. Sadly, I'm not good at rejection. I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> It's in the opening scene that they steal some information on a flash drive. Cue the opening credits. And that's highly underwhelming. I really hope that's not indicative of what the rest of the movie has to offer. At least the opening credits are cool. Though I still don't know why they chose to draw Dick Grayson looking like this. I mean, everyone else just kind of looks similar to their actual cartoon counterpart, but who made this design choice and why did you do that? But whatever, it's it's a minor thing. I'm I'm gonna overlook it because if I, if I just if I nitpick, then we're gonna we're gonna be here all day. We're gonna be here several days. We come back to the scene of the crime where Batman gives some basic plot exposition, and it's also where we see the origins of Swamp Thing, and that's when Poison Ivy and Jason Woodrue's evil plans are finally revealed. They're looking to turn everyone into plants. <gasps> I know. I'm just as shocked as you are. I mean. I hate to be that guy, but isn't this always Poison Ivy's plan? Wasn't her first episode in the animated series this exact plan? I'm just saying, that's her whole premise, you know? Y you think that she'd move on and create a giant man-eating Venus flytrap that could engulf all of Gotham City or something? I, I mean, I don't know, it's not good, but, you know, at least she's trying something different. I know the expression is, if you fail at first, then try, try again. But you know, maybe, maybe try a different plan. Don't, don't just do the same thing. You keep doing the same thing, you're not gonna get a different outcome. It didn't work the first time, second, third, fourth. The fifth time, probably still not gonna work. Insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over again, oh, expecting shit. shit to change. That is crazy. Holland was transformed into Swamp Thing. 
That's it. That's what attacked me. Whoa, hey, easy there, bigot. All green, hairy nature enthusiasts don't look alike. I ain't no racist. I mean, some of my best friends are plant people. Due to Ivy being the main threat, it's decided that Nightwing should track down her only known associate, that chick from the Big Bang Theory. Hey, thanks again for helping us out with that League of Assassins thing in Nanda Parbat. Oof, that Lady Shiva. It's moments like this that I really like about the film, when it's doing some additional world building. Just think, this whole animated universe started back in the 90s, and all these years later, it's still expanding its lore. Take the Donenfeld Expressway to Bloodhaven. Black Condor, Elongated Man, Triumph, Bloodwind. I think passing comments like this that let us know that not only has time passed, but new threats have turned up is actually somewhat interesting. Lady Shiva, while somewhat prominent in Batman comics, to my knowledge, was never acknowledged before this throwaway line. But now, canonically, she's out there. Somewhere. Doing something. Or some- I know it's just a small detail, but all the small details here add up and it really gives me more of an appreciation for the overall continuity. I feel like I said that exact line in another video, but hey, I, I do that from time to time, so why stop now? Meanwhile, Nightwing manages to find the girl in question at a diner called Super Babes, where waitresses dress up as your favorite superheroines or super villain nesses. Is that, is that the, is that the proper way of saying that? By the way, did I mention before that this gets kind of fanservice-y? Oh wait, maybe I was a little bit too premature with that one. Let, let's just wait a minute. Did I tell you before that this gets fanservice-y? See, that felt good. That felt like the right time. Anything else for you today, boys? Uh, no. Okay, pause. Now, now, now I gotta bring this up. I have to harp on this here. With all due respect to Melissa Ranch, or Ranch, whatever the hell her name is, she is an awful Harley Quinn. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sure she's good in other things, but here, not so much. He's just the voice, it's not the, the right, like, tone. Not quite my tempo. <laughs> Sounds more like a witch, like, with a cackle. Yeah, she does sound like a witch. I am not a fan of Bernadette as Harley Quinn. Personally, I much prefer Penny as Harley Quinn. Wow, I always wondered what the bat cave looked like. So this must be where you f*** the bat. Hmm. Seriously though, she's 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 pretty great. There is nothing about Melissa's performance that feels real or genuine. And look, I know that we're talking about a cartoon about a man in gray tights with black bat ears, but Kevin Conroy gives a very legitimate performance. He speaks with complete conviction, and his delivery always sounds authentic. Except that one time they asked him to laugh in the killing joke. I think the world was better off without that scene. I, I still can't sleep at night. Whereas Melissa here kind of comes off as someone desperately trying to sound like Harley Quinn. And let me just say, you're laying it on a little bit too thick with the accent there. Just dial it back a bit, relax. I just get the feeling that she did the same thing I do from time to time, where I just want to get what I'm saying out of the way, so I can get to my next line. But meanwhile, I'm completely butchering my way through the script, because I'm not being patient, and I'm not giving each and every line the attention it deserves. And here's what throws me off even more. They brought back the original voice actors for Batman and Nightwing, but not for Harley. Look, I, I get that Arlene Sorkin kind of retired her time as the character after Arkham Asylum. I get that. I'm understanding. But Tara Strong has basically been seen as the go-to voice after her for years now. And she does such a good job that there's plenty of people who don't even realize that Harley is now being played by Batgirl. I'm under the impression that she was actually added to the cast because the Big Bang Theory was also on the air at the time. But her performance just doesn't seem worth the potential name recognition they'd get for this movie. Maybe it's just me. It is a possibility, but, but for me, for the most part, I couldn't stand her as the character. Nightwing follows Harley back to her apartment, where she exclaims that she's reformed, and doesn't tangle with either side of the costume crowd. The former Robin insists that he needs her help, and more importantly, Ivy might need her help. Harley insists that she's done with that part of her life, but the boy Blunder pushes the issue and claims she's clearly foaming at the mouth for the chance to get back that part of her life. I mean, otherwise, why else would she subject herself to working at a place called Super Babes? After threatening to report her for not following up with her parole officer, a fight ensues, and Harley kinda kicks Nightwing's ass. 
and they trust this guy with Bloodhaven? She even secretly doses him with Joker Venom. When he awakes, he finds himself tied to her bed, and wow! Harley's really out here giving Cardi B a run for her money, huh? I just wanna say now, if the roles were reversed here, and this was a male supervillain tying down a female superhero to a bedpost, regardless if there was or there wasn't a sexual context in said situation, there would be outrage. Do you remember when a few years before this movie came out, a variant comic cover was released for The Killing Joke? It was this picture. This one right here. This for a little bit caused a whole bunch of controversy, with people labeling the artist sexist and misogynistic for creating it. This scene, however, was never questioned. Where was Harley Quinn's cancellation, Twitter? Look, I I'm not saying either side is right here. I'm just looking for some damn consistency. And speaking of consistency right quick, I also want to point out that there are some people who claim that these new additions to the DC animated universe aren't actually canon. Which would surprisingly make total sense, and also make no sense at all. Considering that this story kind of completely contradicts what we know about Harley Quinn's character. In Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, we're shown a flashback, which shows that she's very much still with the Joker up until the end. Of her career, that is, because, because she doesn't actually die here. She shows up later in the film as the Olsen twins' elderly grandmother. Barbara Gordon even makes reference to Harley in the movie, stating, We never found her body, but I doubt she'd be starting trouble now. And that Harley pretty much disappeared after that day, with nobody knowing what happened to her. This movie writes her off as having disappeared, being found, teaming up with Batman, and by the end of it, ending up with her own TV show. I'm sorry for the spoilers, but that's what happens. Which is a far cry from, we never saw Harley again. So, those two stories kinda, kinda, kinda don't, don't go together. Unless I'm supposed to believe that this happened before that flashback in Batman Beyond. Meaning Harley and Joker broke up, she went straight for a little bit, but ultimately wound back up with him again. Which I guess isn't impossible, but it does seem a little bit I improbable. So I guess with that information you could say, Maybe this is an Elseworlds tale. But then why does it have the same animation style of the animated series? A good chunk of the same cast, and it even goes out of its way to reference the original shows all throughout its runtime as if it's connected to it. It's Nightwing. Wing. Eh? It's Nightwing. Guess I was thinking of that goopy mullet you used to have. Plus it has Bruce Tim attached to it, and I think legally, automatically, that means it's tied to the animated universe. While Nightwing is tied up, Harley decides to start monologuing. But not over some ultimate evil plan, but instead about how she's been forced to take up waitressing and essentially cosplaying as herself, because nobody's really willing to hire a former technical terrorist. Imagine that. I mean, I didn't see her resume personally, but I'd hope that she'd know enough to not have the Joker on as a reference. That's all I'm saying. Harley decides to undress. And seriously, am, am I watching an animated DC movie, or did I just log into the wrong tube website? I said before that there was fan service in this movie, and there is, like, like, like a lot of it, like, like, a, like a whole lot of it. Here I am helping you guys out, pro boner, I might add. But amongst all the animated curves and cracks is also what reads like the fetish section of Pornhub. I mean, look at this. And anyway, maybe I should help out. Sounds like Ivy could be in some serious trouble. Don't bother yelling for help. Nobody in the whole building but us. Oh God, no! Stop! Stop! <laughs> you stop it! You're gonna make me pee! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> It's not so bad. Oh, man. Down on my knees, would you make me beg you pretty please? Fetish, fetish shit! What the effing f*** am I watching? I don't remember all that from back in the- was that in the original series? I don't think so. I must- I must have drowned that right out. Anyway, so Harley consensually raped Robin. And that is a sentence I never thought I would have to say. Although that does seem to be a common trope with Nightwing for one reason or another. You know, minus the consent part. And I just want to know, uh, mind you, I'm not mad. I'm not angry. No one's going to be punished. I, I, just, I, just, 
I just want to know which one of you fanfic.net writing strange shipping bat bots is responsible for Harley X Old Robin. Look, I'm not saying that this is blasphemy, cause, cause I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it is. But it's just so out of left field. Did they even share screen time together all that often in the original animated series? I mean, it's not like I think this is terrible or anything. It's just I, I, I don't, I don't know what to make of this. You know what? It, it, it may be bad. It, it might actually be really bad. It might be awful. But, but quite frankly, at this point in the runtime, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just numb to it. Oh yay, a leaf. Kind of like all of these. No, not like those. See, it is colored in differently from the rest of the background. Elsewhere, Ivy's locking lips with some poor schlub to keep him under her control, much to the dismay of the moronic man, and also everybody watching at home. I don't need to see that. The doctor is helping them create the Krabby Patty super secret formula. I think now is a good time to mention Poison Ivy is also given a new voice actress, and she's... she's alright. For the most part, I mean, she's not bad. She's all right. That's all I gotta say. I mean, it's a little jarring hearing a completely different voice coming out of a character that spoke with a significantly different voice previously. Subtropica Brasilius. As rare as winter roses, Batman. Our plans are for the improvement of every organism on Earth. The very definition of humane. But, you know, it's not bad. It's different. It was pretty good. It was all right. It wasn't great. But it was fine. Batman walks in on... Whatever that was, and if you know what it is, please, please don't, please don't tell me. I'm, I'm happier living in, in ignorant bliss. And see that? See that right there? That look of shame that Nightwing has on his face right here? That's the same exact look I had after realizing I just spent my hard-earned work dollars on Batman and Harley Quinn. Wait, she's coming with us? Well, yeah, dick. I think you kind of already made sure she's coming with at least one of you. If you did your job right. The Bat family gains a new temporary partner, as Harley tags along for the ride. Maybe I'll call you sometime, okay? Like when I'm out of batteries or something. Meanwhile, Poison Ivy and this talking dime bag are in the midst of replicating the formula that created Swamp Thing, so that they can create a greener Earth. Batman gives us more exposition on Ivy's master plan. He basically explains that if Ivy is successful, the best case scenario is that everyone is mutated into a plant person. Worst case scenario, the accidental extinction of all life on Earth. The f- <laughs> <laughs> Why? Oh, yo, Harley Quinn cut ass! Harley tracks down one of Ivy's top henchmen, which leads to a chase. And uh, uh, no, no, wait, wait, pause, stop. Hold up. Are we really gonna act like people just hop from building to building with ease in this world? I mean, Batman? Sure. Robin? Fine. Batgirl? Okay. But Harley Quinn? You're pushing it. You really, really... She didn't even have a cape. You know what? I I'll give you this. I'll give you that. But some random no-name thug? No, 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 I I I'm sorry. There is suspension of disbelief, and then there is bullshit. And if my nostrils aren't mistaken, this is bullshit. Not to mention that they literally get nothing out of this, because that's not actually Ivy's henchman. It's some dude who Harley went to prom with. Look, I get it. A and I'd be lying if I said it didn't get a smirk out of me. But in the overall plot of this movie, it's meaningless. And that's okay to do once. But there are a bunch of things in this movie that are done, you know, just cause. Harley eventually leads the dynamic duo to a henchman hideout, where we see many of the mindless goons Batman has previously encountered. Hey, Logan and Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, bruh. Love you too, bruh. Yo, why is he talking to Afro Man over here? Harley gets some information on her gal pal, but not before giving us a musical number. Which, I'll be honest, is actually one of my favorite parts of the movie. It's not a bad performance at all. Look, even Batman's into it. And Nightwing is... Uh, well, well, okay. Maybe, maybe he's actually a little too into it. A little bit less. Dial it back. Don't call me past 11 p.m. We won't have it again. If it was 11, 12, it happened three times, three, four times, three, five times. Three, six times, six times, it happened three times, but it went to... You will call me at 10.59, but don't call me past 11, because that's my new rule now. Despite Harley clearly tearing the house down, and giving Blondie a run for her money, the audience of henchmen aren't looking for an encore. 
they're looking for revenge. And since this is Batman we're talking about, you can imagine how well that goes. There's also a bunch of references to Adam West Batman in this, and these references are all relatively close to each other. I can appreciate the old shoutouts and tip of the hat to the previous generations, or, or iterations of the character. But it's just a little strange seeing the animated series Batman acting like the 1960s version of that character. They are worlds apart. They might have the same birth certificate, but they're two different people. Mind you, this isn't exactly a complaint, it's just, it's just hard to watch this and not make a mental note of that. I would think that this is some kind of tribute to the late great Catman, but I remember this movie coming out roughly around the same time that the OGB passed away. After they fight their way back to the Batmobile, we get a call from Booster Gold, who is treated with the exact level of respect you'd hope he'd be treated with. Sorry Booster, going under some high tension wires. That sounds like paper. Over and out. And side note, that's actually Bruce Timm himself playing the voice of everybody's least favorite superhero. The terrible trio meet face to face with Mother Nature and Father... N -n nature I guess I, I didn't really think that went through. There's a fight. There's some fire. And that's the full scene. Can I get my money now? The professor helping Ivy is killed off. And Harley really shows her humanity by compassionately comforting this dying stranger. Years later on the DC app's Harley Quinn series, I'm sorry to keep bringing it up, it is really good, seriously. In that series, Harley exclaims that she's a bad guy, but not a bad person. And that's not something original to that show. That's pretty much always been the character's duality. Yes, she's a villain, and yes, sometimes she does awful things, but in the end, there's many more awful things she would never be able to bring herself to do. And despite what a first impression might give you of her character, she can be really empathic. Again, this is another scene I really like from the movie. Elsewhere, feeling somewhat remorseful is Poison Ivy, who is reassured by Dankman over here that they did what needed to be done. Like Harley, Poison Ivy isn't exactly all evil. She has good intentions, but her actions aren't always admirable. Still, she does all that she does in an attempt to preserve life. But I'm not really gonna get into the depth of Pamela Isley, especially not when talking about Batman and Harley Quinn, so really, let's just move on with it. Just then, this big sentient weed nug pulls out a yam and tells Ivy to bite into it. And now they're both high as hell! Holy crap, guys, you did it! You really did- you really made Poison Ivy and the Floronic Man get high on their own supply. I was kidding when I referred to him as Dank Man. But you did it! That was it. This is a real thing. You turned Jason Woodrow into Captain Kush. Did Kevin Smith come in and do touch-ups to the final script? Oh shit, they tripping. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you didn't tell me this was an edible. Dude, I don't think that was weed we just smoked. <laughs> Become one with the green! <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta give me some of the yams. That was a very tasty Thanksgiving dinner right there. Elsewhere, Batman makes the decision to continue on his mission without Harley, which doesn't really fly by her. And of course, in the end, Harley gets her way. I'm sure you could have imagined that, though, given the Nightwing before. She's persistent. Oh, please, Mr. Kinda Scary, but actually really nice Batman. <laughs> Isn't that you too? <laughs> I don't know how to take that. <laughs> Can I just take the time to mention right now, after re-watching this for the upteenth time? Dick's kind of a dick, isn't he? I mean, he's always got this smarmy look on his face, and he's always nonchalantly smirking. What a smug little b- And that shrug. I swear, if I see his pompous prick shrug one more time, I I I'm gonna cut the shoulders off that boy. <laughs> the good guys and bad guys show up in Swamp Thing's Ground Zero, where Harley- as Batman suspected, betrays the two men named after winged creatures in favor of helping her BFF. She first tries to reason with her partner in crime, but after seeing that that's a meaningless effort, Harley destroys Ivy's tree, setting Batman and not Robin free. Yeah, those bars. We get another fight scene. And yeah, look, I, I know I'm not exactly calling play-by-play -play here for you guys, so let me go get somebody to do just that. Ivy's plant monsters take out numerous nameless officers aiding the caped crusader. Batman and Nightwing get beat by the Floronic Man, and Harley and Ivy reenact one of my favorite scenes from Step Brothers. Eventually, Harley manages to reason with Ivy by manipulatively crying. And it works! 
It's not like it, it, there, there was a real tearjerker moment here either. She she just flat out said she's going to use this against Ivy. She takes her mask off and cries. And, and Ivy's like, oh shit, F fuck the trees. That's it. That's it. Pretty girl crying saves the day. Well, I guess maybe the afternoon because there's still more to this day. And Jason Woodrow's still pissed. But bad news for him because here's the Swamp Thing cameo we've been building up this whole movie for. Though your cause is just, your actions have upset the balance. But it is not my place to judge. Wait, what? See, now, again, I get it. And it would be funny if he didn't already do the whole, LOL, this was a pointless joke several times already. And this was the best way you can think to include Swamp Thing? Disgraceful! Now, now here's what I, a creative genius, would have done if I was in charge of making this movie. Here, here's, here's my edit of the Swamp Thing cameo. He's like an onion. He's got layers. <laughs> See that? Infinitely better. Seriously, DC, give me the book. I clearly know what I'm doing. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but does 44,000 subscribers mean anything to you? Probably not. I return now to the Parliament of Trees. Not the trees have a parliament too? Where is the Senate of the Trees then? <laughs> He's like, the trees got bureaucracy now. <laughs> Against all tradition, the bad guy actually wins here. Until Harley decides to burn him because he's made out of weed. Leaves, 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 I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's a long day, this is a strange movie. And that's how the movie ends. Like a goddamn Looney Tunes short. Beautiful. That was Batman and Harley Quinn. And it is, uh, really a mixed bag. This is a strange fever dream of an animated Batman movie. And like I said at the beginning of this video, it's all over the place. And the references are, are head-scratching, to say the least. Like, there's one part of the movie where Harley decides to reference the seduction of the innocent book. A, a book which is a very real book that claimed that Batman and Robin was trying to indoctrinate kids into a gay lifestyle. There's a shitload of Adam West Batman shoutouts, and I don't, I don't really know why. A big issue I do take with the movie is that there never really feels like there's any real threat. Ivy's master plan has been overdone to death by now. And it doesn't matter if you add Jason Woodrue and Swamp Thing's Chemical X. It's still just a tired rehash of a story that's already pretty much been perfected. The villains seem necessary only to start the plot up to give Batman and Harley a reason to team together. But after that story starts, they just seem almost irrelevant to everything else going on. Everything in this movie, the villains, the plot, Batman, everything, seems to take a backseat to Harley Quinn. And I feel like a more fleshed out concept would have worked a bit better, rather than just piecing something together to put a spotlight on a character. This movie does give you occasionally really entertaining moments, especially when it isn't taking itself too seriously and the runtime is spent cracking jokes. Like I said, this movie did genuinely get me and my friends to crack up while watching it. Here's a little highlight reel of the scenes that I'm talking about. Gonna lose that hand, puddin'. <laughs> hey chick, this crazy broad broke my freaking arm! That Lady Shiva. Wouldn't say no to a slice of that pie, know what I mean? So, did you get what you needed? Well... Yeah, uh, Evie's whereabouts, of course, that's what you meant. Like you never made out with a supervillain. When this whole thing is over, you're gonna put in a good word for me with the parole board. No. Don't you need? I don't make deals with psychopaths. Sociopath! Jeez, why does everybody always get that wrong? I'm sorry, Batman. That's classified. My hands are tied. Strange that you would put it just that way. What Mistress Ilsa does for me is considered therapy. 
in some countries. These are genuinely funny scenes, and the movie also does provide occasional heartwarming moments. But amongst these good things is a sea of puzzling choices that would even have the Riddler stumped. I can't really say that I'm a fan of this movie, but I guess I also don't hate it entirely. I will say this though, there's plenty of times I'm creeped out by it, don't, don't know what's going on, don't want to find out. So really just overall, it's a real roller coaster of emotion for me. Everyone's been calling me Dairoku Tin Mouth, the Demon King! This way you won't look too suspicious. Excuse me, why? Batman Ninja is one of the most batshit crazy movies ever put to Blu-ray, DVD, and digital download. This is by far the strangest incarnation of Batman in all of live action or animated history. And not for the reasons that you're probably thinking, but also for those reasons as well. And you're probably thinking, oh, V's just exaggerating because this is anime Batman. This is Batman in ancient Japan. But I don't think you're understanding just how Japanese this is. You add in a little bit more fan service and a pair of tentacles, and this is the most Japanese movie to ever Japan. Am I making sense? Probably not, but I guess that's fitting because we're talking about Batman Ninja. Batman Ninja. Even the title is just, I, 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 I I'm losing my mind. Batman Ninja is just, I, I, how do I even describe to you Batman Ninja? Where do I begin? Batman v Superman is a more coherent film. This movie makes Batman and Robin look like Citizen Kane. Batman and Harley Quinn is a more competent picture than this. Batman Ninja makes the Killing Joke cartoon look like the Killing Joke comic book. The Beware the Batman series has a better and more fleshed out story than this. To call this movie insane would be offensive to all the inmates at Arkham Asylum. And let me just start off by saying I dropped the ball on this one. I dropped the ball. I was watching Batman Ninja with Black Friend Alan. Real name by the way, I've seen his birth certificate. And we considered filming our reaction to this movie to use for this future video, but then I decided against it because the camera's batteries were charging and I just, I just wanted to watch a movie to pass the time. Besides, I didn't really think that this movie would provide us all that much content. But oh, how wrong I was. How wrong I was. Me and Alan wound up taking a shot of Crystal Head Vodka every time something insane happened, and by the end of it, Alan was slurring his words so much that he made little to no sense, and I wasn't sure if it was from the drinking or the pure confusion at what he was watching. Probably a combination of both. I couldn't tell if it was from the booze or from the bats. That's how insane this movie gets. Luckily, I did manage to film a few of my other friends' reactions to the movie, and I will be using them throughout this video. What the fuck is going on? So with that being said, as Michael Keaton once said, Come on! Let's get nuts. We open up to a modern-day Arkham Asylum, with a Catwoman narration that seems more in place in an Arkham Knight DLC. You think you've heard every Batman story? I promise, you haven't. How right you are. Inside the asylum, Batman and Gorilla Grodd are in the midst of a battle with Catwoman present when one of Grodd's devices goes off and seems to suck all those who surround it into a vortex. And this time, curiosity almost killed this cat. Batman, of course, instead of trying to avoid it, meets it head on. Smart. And I'm gonna pause this right here. I'm sorry, I know it's pretty early on in this review to, to stop the film for my commentary, but this confused me the first time watching this. Because I didn't know anything about this movie. At all. I didn't watch the trailers, but, but I, I seen that they were up on YouTube. I saw the artwork for this. And I guess I was just under the impression from the images and screenshots of the movie that this was another Batman Elseworld story. A one-off alternate version of the character. And in some ways, it kinda is. But also, it's not. You see, this isn't an alternate Batman of ancient Japan story. This is a Batman goes to ancient Japan story. And even after watching this, I think the former would be a little bit more ideal than the latter. But then again, the latter did provide this review, so gotta thank the boys at the WB for that. Batman arrives in ancient Japan, a conclusion which Bats comes to relatively quickly. From a 
the look of it, this is ancient Japan. There he is! There's our boy! World's greatest detective! Upon his arrival, he's immediately attacked by a group of samurai, who look to take him out. Don't want to hurt any of you! So that was a f***ing lie. We were sent to find the bat. Who's your master? Okay, first off, Kinky. And secondly, who's their master? Who's their master? Did you look at their masks? Their pale face, giant smile, pointed nose, purple helmet with a small flower design on the side? Masks? The world's greatest detective, folks. People who have never picked up a Batman comic or watched a Batman movie or played a Batman video game would be able to figure out who they're working for. But Bats, he needs to question it. Instead of heading into round two, Batman drops his lucky eight-sided dice, allowing him to make his escape in a cloud of smoke. Batman tries to use the bad computer built into his suit, only to find that ancient Japan doesn't have any Wi-Fi. He then makes his way over to a palace where he sees who else but Kafka from Final Fantasy. Oh my god! Come on, I, I can't be the only one who thought that. All in all, I don't hate the design. There definitely have been worse Jokers, and yeah, I'm looking at you. That's right, Bats. It is I. Damn you! <laughs> With all due respect, that is bullshit. Allow me to give you an artistic recreation of how this situation would have ended up if someone actually tried to sneak up on Batman. I mean, seriously, you don't get one over on the Dark Knight, folks. And Harley Quinn. Everyone's been calling me Dairoku Tin Mouth, the Demon King, the most powerful man in Japan. But you can call me Lord Joker. The style of this movie is really different from what you'd find in your standard Batman movie or game. And I'm not just talking about the setting. Though that's also true. I can't think of too many times Batman had to head to ancient Japan. But the artwork and the animation style are really intriguing. And I'm not an art expert, so I don't want to go on with this for too long, but I definitely can appreciate the visuals. As they stand out is one of the most positive traits this movie has to offer. Batman and Joker duke it out because... They're Batman and the Joker, that's... That's, that's kind of their thing, that's kind of what they do. With Joker delivering painfully lame punchlines throughout. What you've done! Poison Ivy would be very disappointed. I have to say I've really enjoyed the sushi here. Mwah! It's even better with some sauce. Don't you know how bad razor-edged fighting fans are for the environment? You're the one who keeps throwing them. Because you won't let them hit you! Oh, don't run away. I'm your biggest fan! <laughs> and who is this guy? Me? Come on, get better material. What are you going to do now, Joker? Oh, I've got options, Bats. I've still got Harley. And an army of samurai who have you surrounded. Batman once again battles Joker samurais and takes out as many as he can before taking off. What was that? I, that was, uh, that was Spider-Man. You can do that in Spider-Man. You can capture someone and go... <laughs> and see, things like this is what I really love about this movie. Seeing Batman interact with this environment for the first time is definitely more visually stimulating than seeing Batman fight in a dark, polluted city at night, usually in an alley of some kind. Don't get me wrong, I love Gotham, and I love it as the background for Batman, but we as an audience have become so accustomed to that, this is something new for both us as a viewer and Batman as a character. He also has to find new ways to protect himself, new shadows to lurk behind, and new ways to look like a bat. It also puts him at a little disadvantage that he's not used to his surroundings, which adds to the central conflict, because let's face it, it's usually Batman's enemies at a disadvantage when facing him. Because... well, because... I'm the goddamn Batman. <gasps> Shall we go after him, Lord J? I've got people. Don't be afraid. It's just a little cat call. Yeah, that's something Catwoman would do, right? Right on the money, guys. That's that's what I think of when I think of Catwoman. Tiny cat hand puppets. 
That's good. No, you guys are no, you guys are doing good. Tell your story. I'm I'm just I'm just the viewer. Catwoman and Batman walk and talk, with Selena giving exposition, explaining that the portal brought Batman to Japan two years later than everyone else at Arkham Asylum, probably because he was the last to get sucked up by the black hole. Catwoman explains that Gorilla Grodd, Joker, Penguin, Poison Ivy, Two Face, Deathstroke, and Harley Quinn, amongst others, were sucked up by Grodd's time machine. Batman also remembers that Nightwing, Robin, Red Robin, and Red Hood were also with him. But Catwoman hasn't seen any of them. Catwoman then goes on to tell Bruce that the Joker, Penguin, Poison Ivy, Deathstroke, and Two-Face have all become lords, and taken over states, and are looking to unite Japan to become its official ruler. Bruce decides to make himself inconspicuous, and takes on a new disguise. This missionary look is not bad. And are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Bruce, you suck! You suck, Bruce! You suck as a detective, and you suck as a master of disguise! You're out here trying to go incognito, and you're carrying around a bat bible with the bat symbol shaved into your head! Are you- Who- Who, who is this supposed to fool? Why do you have a bat symbol on your head? Oh, that's strange. Is that cool? Why? I don't why? Know. This way you won't look too suspicious as a westerner. You are immediately the most suspicious person in all of Japan, in all of Japan's history. If people are looking for Batman, why would you, when trying to divert attention from yourself, would you have the bat symbol all over your being? At best, they think that you were associated with the bat. Also, how? How did you grow a beard from one shot into the next? It's never explained. I guess I'm supposed to think that it's fake. Did you take the hair follicles off your head and glue them to your face? I don't understand you, Bruce. I want to, but I don't. Selena and Bruce find the Joker's tampering with history by already having Cole. Okay. And oh yeah, Alfred's also here. Care for some tea, sir. Oh, much appreciated. <laughs> Alfred. Which makes sense, I guess, considering we saw footage of him with the Batmobile before. But wait, hold on! If we're going with the narrative that Batman wound up getting to ancient Japan two years after everyone else because he got hit with the blast later, how did Alfred make it there before him? My head is beginning to hurt! He was way further away from the time machine's eruption than Batman. We're only 14 minutes into this movie's runtime, and you already messed up your own time travel narrative! Oh, and there's a bad cave. And oh, the Batmobile made it to ancient Japan before bro How? How did this happen? I want answers, damn it! I can't believe you didn't tell me, Selena. I know, but I wanted to see the look of surprise on your face. See the look of surprise on your face. See the look of surprise on your face. The Joker Samurai fire cannons at the cave, blowing it to smithereens. But Batman charges at the Joker's hired hands in the Batmobile. Across a sea of water. Heading straight past them and straight for the Joker's palace. As Batman makes his way through Joker's obstacles, suddenly the Casa de Joker, I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not I'm not Spanish, begins to transform. Because Japan. Harley, activate Arkham Castle. You know when I think Batman, I don't necessarily think Batman in ancient Japan. And if I did, for, for some reason, think Batman in ancient Japan, I wouldn't think Batman fighting Megazord. And oh, oh, if you think this is wild, you ain't seen nothing yet. We, we're just getting started. As Batman races toward Joker, Voltron grabs the Batmobile and begins to crush it in its hands. But Batman busts out of it by self-destructing the Batmobile and ejecting into the Batwing. Batman continues his boss battle, shooting at the Transformer until Emperor Joker has it crush the Batwing's Batwings. But Batman manages to rid the wing of its wings and ride down on the Batcycle, the Batbike, the Bat... Well, whatever, you, you get the point, you, you know what it is. And I gotta say, I actually really like the way that this depicts the Batmobile. This is an interesting series of events, and seeing all of Batman's vehicles used in one action sequence, well, it's kinda cool. And for all the faults this movie has, its fighting scenes, its battles, and its actions aren't one of them. Or three of them. What you, you, you understand what I'm trying to say. When Batman finally gets to the Joker, he threatens to kill a mother and child. And I couldn't help here but get flashbacks to Batman Vengeance. I just kept saying out loud, it's Harley Quinn. It's Harley Quinn. It's Harley Quinn. I'm gonna guess that it's Harley Quinn. And oh, what do you know? It's it's Harley Quinn. Poor Bat! He always falls <laughs> for the same tricks. You 
What? 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 Who invited Bane? I was so confused by this because Catwoman mentioned every other villain shown in this movie. Bane is the only one who just seems to show up out of nowhere. And when me and Alan watched this, he began to theorize that this actually was an Elseworld version of Bane. But if you look back at this one shot that's on the screen for three seconds, there's Bane, look, all the way in the corner there. Was I, was I supposed to catch on to that? Because I didn't. Because I didn't the first five times I watched this movie. And while I think it's interesting that Bane would become a sumo, because A, he's a big strong dude, and B, he's always wore the mask of a luchador, so seeing him switch it over to being a sumo wrestler is a, I suppose, reasonable choice. I got a question. How did this dude go from buff to double stuffed in the course of two years? Did you spend your time in ancient Japan just trying the latest cuisines? I, I, don't, I don't get it. Look, I'm not one to talk about body image, but but... That's unreasonable to me. Well, luckily Batman's not in too much trouble because his motorcycle then transforms into a robotic bat suit, and I hate how much I like this. I hate it. I, I hate it, because I like it. I mean, yes, it's improbable, but you know, so it's entertaining, so. They also didn't bother giving him an English voice actor, so he just speaks in Japanese the whole time with no subtitles. It's a good choice, guys. So Batman beats Bane by slamming him into a tree. And killing him, apparently, because that's the last time we ever see him in this movie. After managing to save the woman and fall into Joker's trap, Joker slides down on what looks to be a giant party horn. <coughs> oh! Joker Harley and Emperor Joker Samurai surround an incapacitated Batman. Are you just going to lie there, or are you going to entertain me some more? I am not here for your entertainment. I have no regrets. Unfortunately for the Smile crew, a colony of bats swarm the area. No. If only your friends were around to come by and say hi. I didn't mean it! I was being sarcastic! Followed by... What? Ninja Batman! Yeah, what she said. What? What? The ninjas help Batman make it back to their ship, where Batman meets back up with Nightwing and Red Robin, and introduces the Dark Knight to the leader of the Bat Ninja Clan, Aeon. Aeon basically explains that Batman was prophesizing, and the Bad Clan view him as a lord. When they finally make their way back to land, they're met by Robin and Monkey Chi. Monkey Chi? It's weird, but Robin's made friends with this monkey. No! No, 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 I'm, I'm drawing a line. I'm putting a line down in the stand. You guys are crossing it right here. You can't just write this off as being weird. This is unacceptable is what this is. Ne never before, never before in my life did I think, oh yeah, you know, uh, the next Batman movie that comes out, probably gonna have a monkey sidekick. No, I would have never thought that. Robin made friends with a monkey? There's a bat monkey now? Ace the Bat Hound wasn't enough for you? You had to make a monkey sidekick? Not to mention that this isn't any Robin. We're not talking, we're not talking about Dick Grayson. When we're not talking about Tim Drake, we're talking about Damian Wayne, Bruce's son and the most unpleasant human being to ever be conceived in comic book history. Is this supposed to be Damian? That's Damian. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny right. because he acts nothing like Damian. Isn't he supposed to be the one that was trained by ninjas? Who? who? Yeah, yes. <laughs> so what does, what, why is Butters Robin? Everyone knows it's Butters. That's me. This kid is a dick. Why is he befriending animals like he's Princess Goddamn Aurora? Who wrote this? I want names and addresses. I demand them. Well, as it turns out, Robin's monkey has an invitation for Batman from Gorilla Grodd. Bruce takes the gorilla up on his offer, meeting him and his monkey companions in a spa. And you know, with the wrong music, you can easily change the context of the scene. You might as well enjoy the waters too. Oh yeah, that's the movie I was actually looking for. Batman questions Grodd on why he invented the time machine, to which he responds, because he good. So logic thus far makes sense to me. Grodd further explains that he was trying to send his competition somewhere far away so that he could take over Gotham for himself. I'm not paraphrasing, that's pretty much what he says verbatim. That was his master plan. Rather than kill his enemies, I'm just gonna send them a, a thousand years in the, I know it's longer than a thousand years, a thousand years in the past to Japan. Right. 
Right, that makes sense. I mean, Batman was shot with a bullet that sent him back in time instead of killing him, so I mean, it makes sense just about as anything else. He also claims that it's Batman's interference seen at the beginning of the movie that's what's responsible for sending everyone to ancient Japan. So Batman... Thanks for meddling. The gorilla and the bat form a temporary alliance to get them back home. And of course, why rule over ancient Japan when you have one poverty-stricken, crime-ridden city? It makes perfect sense to me. Actually, come to think of it, what was Gorilla Grodd even doing in Gotham City? He lives in Gorilla City. He's not even really a Batman enemy. He's a Flash villain. What even is any of this? Why did they do this? Why is he bathing with monkeys in ancient Japan looking to take over Gotham? I don't get it. It just doesn't make sense. It does not compute. I don't get it. We're not even halfway through this movie and I'm tearing the last remaining follicles out of my head. The next day, Batman and Gorilla Grodd set sail until they come in contact with Joker's ship, to which the Bat Clan has them surrounded under sea. Harley and the Joker's devout followers begin spraying bullets in the surrounding waters, but oh, it was just a ruse. It, it was, it was, it's just a prank, bro. No one died and Batman and Grodd aren't even in a rowboat. They're on a rowboat on top of a ship. It was all a diversion. But wait, if Joker and Harley were above the boat from where they were, wouldn't they be able to see the giant ship holding the rowboat underneath it? Like, I mean, at least vaguely. You know what, never mind. I'm trying to find logic in Batman Ninja, so clearly I'm the one in the wrong right now. The ships collide with the Bat Family, Catwoman, Gorilla Grodd, and the Ninja Clan hopping on board and finding themselves a target. Catwoman goes after Harley, because, you know, they're both girls. The Bat Family and the Clan go after Joker Samurai, and Batman and Grodd corner the Joker. And again, scenes like this are really where this movie excels. The action is consistently compelling. Joker and Harley are apprehended. I never thought you need help from a talking monkey to catch me. I'm so embarrassed for you, Batman. Only for Grodd to turn around and betray Batman by attempting to mind control his ninja clan. And my father always told me never to trust a talking monkey. Uh, I mean, of course, that was after a few bottles of Jack Daniels and rewatching Dr. Doolittle for the upteenth time, but I think this validates that blind talking primate prejudice. Unfortunately, things don't go exactly as planned, as the clan are so well trained that they have complete control over their bodies and minds. Grodd goes with plan B, calling for Two-Face, who is apparently in a ship out in the distance, to start firing its cannons at the Batship. The Batship, that's something I really said, huh? I can fly! He can fly! He can fly! He can talk! <laughs> Catwoman confronts Grodd with a collateral. She managed to get her paws on a piece of Grodd's time machine during her fight with Harley. And in exchange for it, she wants to be taken back to the future. And who wouldn't? It's a fantastic series. The Bat Boat... I called it a Bat Boat. The Bat Boat is set ablaze from the cannon strikes, as Joker and Harley somehow manage to sneak away. Batman rushes his followers off the boat to safety, but proclaims he's staying behind and making sure that Joker's not getting away. Kafka manages to seek the high ground, where he and Harlequin light an explosive barrel before sending it toward Batman. Joker, no! What the fuck? I'm gonna cut things off here for the time being, if only because there's only so much insanity. There's only so much that I could take in one sitting. I've seen this movie too many times, and we still haven't even scratched the surface of, of where it's gonna go. So I want to give you, the viewer, a bit of an intermission here, because while we've gotten glimpses of just how wild this movie can be, we, we haven't even scratched the surface. We're, we're, we're nowhere near the level that this movie takes things to. Consider this an intermission for your own mental health. I'm looking out for you. So rest easy, take a breather, and tune back in next Wednesday to see how batshit crazy this Batman adventure gets. Unless you're watching this in the future, in which case, yo, you guys got flying cars yet or what's up? I want to reassure all of you that the wait is worth it because if you think you've seen all the weird shit that this movie has to offer, and if you think you've seen enough, then you know how crazy this film is about to be. Hang on to your hats, folks, because you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs>
I expect Batman to be a fucking ninja. Hey there, I'm V Infuso, and welcome back to taking a look at the most bizarre Batman ever put to video. And that's including my non-Batman, Batman-related project from back in the day. This still beats it. One thing I need to comment on is that this movie is only an hour and 25 minutes long. That's hardly even long enough for it to be considered a movie. And yet there's so much to comment on here that in this mere less than an hour and a half long movie that I've been forced to split my review into two. And not only that, I needed to take over a year long break in between part one and part two. And everyone trying to correct me in the comment section, I can hear you in the back of my mind already. I made that video a long time before it was posted. As a matter of fact, so much time has passed in between me making part one to now making part two, that you may realize that my branding has changed. Yeah, back then I used to call myself the SIJW, and now, you know, just plain old V Infuso. P people were getting confused. Plus, when you uh, enter a venue and somebody actually recognizes you from YouTube and calls out to you, Social Injustice Warrior, it's gonna, it's gonna alter your perspective and make you rethink a couple of your life choices. But like I said in my first video, you ain't seen nothing yet. This movie is by far the strangest Batman story ever animated. And with that being said, let's pick this back up where we left off. And if you haven't watched part one of the video, or it's been a while for you, I suggest you go back and watch that. Because as a matter of fact, it's been so long for me that I had to go and do the same thing. Now, where was I? Penguin, whose eyebrows are shaped in the form of the bat symbol, for some reason, was that even intentional? I don't know! Penguin, Poison Ivy, Deathstroke, Two-Face, and now Gorilla Grodd are all shown to have a different power converter to Grodd's Quake Engine. Until Grodd can gain access to them, they can't go back to the future. Great Scott! Isn't eating a banana a little cliche? Says the cat burglar in the cat costume. I give it to you, you got me there! Right. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but the movie really excels in creative visuals. The cinematography of this movie is top-notch. It has a lot of interesting shots that help tell its tale. And I really enjoy this. I feel like the people who made this movie really cared about the story they were telling. They could have very easily used standard angles and just allowed the story to unfold in front of the viewer. You know, some really uncreative and unimaginative shit, like 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 me whenever I tried to direct any anything anything at all. It was just kind of just kind of point and shoot, just just let stuff happen in, in front of you. But shots like this seem to have more purpose. Sometimes it's to tell us more about the characters without always spelling it out for us. Well, no time to continue analyzing the movie. I need to get back into ripping it apart. You are a sad, strange little man. Bruce wakes up two days after the explosion to find his old bat cal destroyed. Luckily, Aeon had one on hand. Of course! No! 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 Uh, we, we don't do that here. But he still decides to wear his messed up one anyway because, you know, it's symbolic. Batman begins monologuing in something that sounds like it'd make more sense as a narration or a voiceover. But here, he's just speaking aloud and talking about his present feelings as if they were past tense. As if he were in a moment in time th that had long passed. Not, not one that is currently unraveling. Luckily, a new camera angle shows that Batman isn't in fact talking to himself, which is a good thing because he already has enough people in his rogues gallery that already do that. I'm looking at you, Harvey. Uh, b both of you. But still, why is he talking like this? Batman gives his team a pep talk before we switch animation styles. And this will not be the last time that that happens in this movie. During this scene, each person figures out their role. Nightwing and Batman will learn the Bat Clan's signature fighting style and teach them theirs. By combining styles, they'll be unstoppable. Red Robin... Yum! Oh god, now these jokes are gonna start. Red Robin, the hero, not the uh, restaurant, will be consulting with the ancient Japanese blacksmiths. The craftsmanship of the ninja blacksmiths is incredible. The precision of their weapons can't be matched even by our 21st century standards. Are you sure about that? So basically, uh, Red Robin will get the weapons. That That's his job. And Alfred has the most important job out of everybody. He's gonna make some bread. Well, you know what they say, wars are won on full stomachs. I'm part of a team! Following this, Robin rushes to Batman because Monkey Chi... Oh, Monkey Chi. Oh, wow. Monkey Chi is in this. How did I forget about Monkey Chi? Because I didn't want to remember. Because I didn't want to remember. Following this, Robin rushes to Batman because Monkey Chi apparently has another message, this time from Red Hood. 
And where the hell is Monkey Chi getting all these goddamn messages? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! Is this monkey a character or a plot device? Well, never mind that, because we're in for yet another animation change. The visuals are nice, but it feels really out of place here. Red Hood is looking quite different these days. Looking a lot less biker badass and much more like he's wearing Lady Gaga fetish gear. Yeah, go ahead, tell me that's something you wouldn't expect to see in one of her music videos. Hood stumbles upon a small farm where he asks for a cup of water from a green-haired farmer and his blonde pigtailed wife. Gee, I wonder who these people are. And hey Jason, whoa, whoa buddy, relax, you know some people just say thank you. Red Hood viciously attacks the farmers and demands they show their true faces. And then he puts the boots to them. Medium style. But what? What, what is this? What is this freeze frame b-roll in between punches? What is going on in this movie? I feel like I'm having a stroke while on acid. What even is this movie? Batman makes the save for the two familiar farmers and confronts Red Hood. And we're shown all this through the victim's eyes. Sort of. You know what, I'm just gonna look past this because like I said, we, we have a lot of insanity to fall into here. And we haven't even reached the rabbit hole yet, let alone fallen down it. We're kind of just following the white rabbit in his trail of, of pellets. Fade to black only to return with Batman questioning the green-haired man who explains that he and his wife can't remember anything about their past. Batman apologizes for Red Hood's behavior, and as they're about to take their leave, the couple become ecstatic over seeing a sprout. Don't let them fool you, Batman. They're up to their same old tricks. I'm not so sure, Red Hood. He's not the Joker, at least not anymore. They both lost their memories in the explosion. There's no need to bother them. The world's greatest detective, folks! As Batman and Red Hood exit, the excited couple's celebratory laughter turns into that of lunacy. And oh gee, I wonder if they're really cured. Have I mentioned that Batman sucks? How is it someone who is supposed to be as intelligent and as knowledgeable as you is constantly fooled when even all those around you, your trainees, you, you, your closest kin, your wards, they seem to know better? How is that possible? You are an incompetent icon. Rewind back to the original animation and fast forward to one month later. And Gorilla Grodd is ready to make his move to destroy his competitors and rebuild the Quake Engine. And how is he gonna do that? Well, with a giant Transformer, of course. But it's okay, because Poison Ivy then responds by using her own giant Transformer. And Penguin responds by, you guessed it, using his own giant Transformer. And then Two-Face responds with using his own giant Transformer. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. Did I mention that this movie takes place in Japan? I, I know I might have skimmed past it at some point. And now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, uh, this is what I was referencing before about how insane this movie gets. But oh, just you wait. Just you wait, because this is just a warm-up. And hey, look, look, I, I don't, don't want to throw out any claims. I'm not really into cancel culture here, but uh, judging by that Terra storyline in the comments, I'm going to demand that we see that young-looking woman's ID. Slade, I... I, I don't trust it. I don't trust it, man. Yeah, he's kinda sus, though. Just a little bit, little bit sus. And now that everybody's finally been introduced and we've got to hear them speak a little, after 47 minutes into the movie, I think now would be a good time to bring up the voice talents that are attached to this project. So let me quickly acknowledge the cast. Now, in most Batman projects, a lot of the time you get a plethora of recycled voice actors. And this is absolutely no exception. As here you have Roger Craig Smith, who played Batman in Arkham Origins, reprising his role. Grey DeLisi, who has previously played Catwoman in the Arkham series, and also the Injustice games, steps back into the role yet again. She also played Black Canary in The Brave and the Bold, Vicky Vale in the Arkham series, Vulture in the Batman, Harley Quinn and Batgirl in the Lego Batman series, and Barbara Gordon and Magpie in Beware the Batman. So yeah, this isn't new territory for her. Tara Strong also returns as Harley Quinn and debuts as Poison Ivy. Tara's also previously played Harley in the Arkham series and the Injustice series. She also played Batgirl in Batman the Animated Series in its final season, as well as Vicky Vale in The Batman. Fred Tatascori, by the way, I'm gonna get a lot of these names wrong. I'm not good at the whole um, talk thing, so um, I apologize for that. Fred Tatasciori plays Gorilla Grodd after previously playing Bane in the Arkham series, Ra's al Ghul in the Batman Begins video game, 
Bane in Lego Batman, Solomon Grundy in Arkham City, and Sergeant Rock in Brave and the Bold. Yuri Lowenthal plays both Robin and Red Hood after previously playing Red Hood in Batman Unlimited. Will Friedle, who is probably best known as Terry McGinnis in Batman and Batman Beyond, and also played Gearhead in The Batman and Blue Beetle in Batman Brave and the Bold, plays the role of Red Robin. Tom Kenny reprises his role as Penguin from the Batman, Lego Batman, and that Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles team up. He's also played Deadshot, Plastic Man, and Babyface in the past. There's clearly a fair share of returning talent here, so this movie obviously cared enough to get the voices right. There's also new additions in Eric Baza, who would play Two-Face, and Tony Hale of Arrested Development fame voices the Joker. And following this, he would go on to play Dr. Psycho in the Harley Quinn series. The voice cast is really, really good. Everybody sounds like their character. Now back to everything else. Back at the Bat... Spa, I guess? They have that scene. You know that scene, where the good guy gives exposition and explains his plans to the audience. The one where all his accomplices get one line of dialogue chiming in. The one you see in every CW superhero show? Yeah, that's the one. It ends with Batman deciding that he will no longer be Batman. He will be Sengoku Batman. Oh great. Now some weeb is gonna make fun of me in the comments section for, for that pronunciation. It was bad enough when I had to read all those names, but, but now I'm gonna, gonna be lectured about anime. So let me just go out of my way to say this now. I will only accept your criticism if you are actually Japanese. And then even then so, I will still more than probably likely ignore it anyway. So, so really, you, you're just wasting all our time. Elsewhere, the villains clash in what looks to be the funniest round of Rock'em Sock'em robots. Hey, I, I'm not caught up. Can someone tell me what season of Power Rangers this is? I mean, what in the name of Pacific Rim is going on here? Have I mentioned before that this movie is Japanese? In all seriousness, I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy all this. I mean, yeah, it's mindless entertainment, but it's entertaining mindless entertainment. I know a lot of you guys are getting confused because I'm making a lot of sarcastic comments, but that's kind of what I do here. It's, it's a big part of the channel, so I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance. But all joking aside, I actually don't hate this movie. I like it. It's different, it's interesting, it's enjoyable. Is it the Batman I know? No, absolutely not. Do I think there's a lot of things that are really strange about the movie? Yes, absolutely. Still like it though. Aeon and the Bat Clan go after the opposing armies leaving Batman and company to take on the Transformers Tokyo. The bots battle it out amongst themselves until Gorilla Grodd essentially possesses Gotham's bigwig villains into doing his bidding, forcing them to combine their robots to join with his. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, it's okay because Grodd's got some throwaway exposition that, that, that it will explain it all away. It's gonna, it's gonna be fine. Point is, this is Batman in ancient Japan fighting an army of Gundams. Really, just, just don't think too much about it. Grodd also reveals that he isn't looking to get back home. He set his sights on ruling all of ancient Japan. And finally, a monkey with a mind. This is what I've been saying from the get-go. I said it from the beginning, and nobody wants to listen to me. Why bother taking over one shitty city when you can control all of Japan? Of course he would want to rule over all of Japan. Who wants that rat-infested, sewer crocodile-having, giant bat-inhabited shithole that's Gotham? Well, like, in comparison, why, why would that even make sense? But before Grodd's dream of another Planet of the Apes sequel is about to take place... I'm going to rule this country and turn it into a kingdom of monkeys and rewrite the history of the world! What? No. The Joker and Harley reemerge. Oh, oh, okay. Joker all of a sudden took over the entire plot and becomes the big bad at the end. Where have I seen this before other than in every single Arkham game that has ever been created? And also a shitload of comic books, and episodes of TV shows, and other animated movies. This is a reoccurring thing. As Joker and Harley kick Cat and Grodd out of his own walking palace, they're of course rescued by the bat Kazuzo, The bat Kazuko. With Batman rescuing Grodd, and leaving Red Hood to save Catwoman. Which is strange, because you'd think the man would be more intent on rescuing his on-again, off-again, on-again, off-again girlfriend instead of saving the giant ape that's trying to kill you! But, you know, priorities. Look, Bruce, if you wanted to see other people, you just could have said it. I mean, damn, man, I understand that the myth is that cats always land on their feet, but she's not actually a cat! She's a cat woman! How could you? I'm a woman. I'm sorry, I... I... <laughs> I mean, I mean what, what were you thinking? Would you figure, oh hey, she's got another eight lives left, what's one down? That's also not true! The robots combine into one, 
and something something Japan. I I, I don't I don't know. I'm I'm just I'm I'm exhausted. I, I don't know. I, I just I just can't anymore. This movie has exhausted me. I'm just, I'm ready to move on. I'm doing this for all of you. This is not for me anymore. I am not enjoying this. I'm, I'm just ready to move on to the next one. And, and, and I'm not talking about the next video. I'm talking about the next life. I'm, just, I'm ready to go. Oh, oh I'm coming. I just, I, I'm done here. I fulfilled my purpose. I, I need to see no more shit down here. Joker explodes stuff, Grodd saves the monkey before tapping out of the fight, but not before handing down the Pied Piper's fiddle, which he uses to control his army of monkeys. Write it down, put that on a t-shirt, that was actually something that I had said. Grodd's legion of primates launch onto and attack the Joker's mech. And now the bat monkey sidekick has a love interest. And as absurd of a thing that is to say, hang on to your bat masks, cause again, you still ain't seen nothing yet. We're on our way, don't worry. They begin playing a different tune on Squidward's clarinet, commanding the monkeys to form into one giant monkey, and you know what? Stop! Stop it! There is no reason that in a review of a Batman movie that I should be able to say monkey as much as I have during this whole video. Bats? Obviously. Cats? Of course. Crocodiles? Okay. But monkey should not come up nearly as much as it has during this Batman movie. Monkey! Holy crap, I need to check my blood pressure. I am, I am not in a good place right now. Uh, enough monkeying around! The giant joke launches attacks the plus-size Curious George that stands before it. But oh shit, Dustin checks in makes the man who laughs check out. The Bat family head over to take down their fallen foe, but the Joker rises to the occasion and quite literally roasts his competition. Several monkeys undoubtedly die. I, I don't care what you say, even if this is that kind of movie, uh, they dead. But to the rescue come bats. No, not Batman. Just bats. Just a shitload of bats. The bats, of course, form one giant bat to protect their monkey brethren. The monkey made monkey and the bat made bat combine to form a giant Batman. Because of course they do. Oh, I'm sorry, I must have misspoke earlier when I asked what episode of Power Rangers was this from. What I should have asked was what episode of Yu-Gi-Oh was this? Because clearly, this is just straight up polymerization. I don't understand how monkeys plus bats equal Batman. But to be fair, I failed math as a kid. But come to think of it, I was pretty good at science and this shit just doesn't seem right to me. Props to the movie, by the way, for using first appearance Batman. It's a nice little nod. Even if I have no idea who they're nodding their heads at. The giant monkey bat is now somehow able to withstand bursts of flames and manages to punch the Bat family into Joker's collapsing castle. Now look, there's a lot of action that takes place here. I'm not gonna break it down and give you play by play because honestly, I feel like that would cheapen the movie for you and that experience, so I'm not gonna do all that. Let me just give you the cliff notes right quick. Batman fights the Joker, Nightwing takes on Penguin, Red Hood goes after Deathstroke, Red Robin clashes with Two-Face, Robin battles Poison Ivy, and of course, Harley and Catwoman have a score to settle. During this, Joker gives some exposition as how he managed to convince Batman he was now sane. But like, honestly, who cares? It's not needed considering the man has fallen for these types of tricks before. I think the thing that annoys me the most about Batman is that he doesn't seem to fall for these types of tricks with any other villain. Except for Catwoman. Maybe he just has a soft spot for clowns and cats. I don't know, it's just wildly inconsistent. Like I said, a lot of action ensues. Take your medicine, kitty kitty, and say goodnight. More bad, more bad, more bad. The monkeys and the bats infiltrate the moving tower and begin to systematically break it down. And on the roof of Optimus Prime, the final battle ensues. And after some pretty impressive looking back and forth, it looks like the Joker has finally done the impossible. And so it's finally over, Batman. But then the real impossible happens because that Batman in samurai gear was no Batman at all. He was just bats. There's a bunch of fucking bats. And then Batman soars into the sky and shows his love for Naruto. And oh, oh, that's it. That's the line. The movie set its own title. Roll credits. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. My, my contract says as soon as that happens, I am allowed to leave. That is it. But I'll be nice and I'll go ahead and give you the ending anyway. They reenact that scene from The Dark Knight. Batman saves the day. They return to their time period. And then there's a mid-credits scene 
where, oh look, that's kind of cute. And also entirely impractical, but all right. And that was Batman Ninja. Even though I, I, I think more accurately, it should be called Batman Samurai. Or, or maybe if, if, you, if you wanted to add the ninja element, Batman Samurai Ninja, I don't know. But Batman Ninja just doesn't seem like a fully fleshed out title. That, just, just my opinion. If you haven't seen Batman Ninja, then go out and see Batman Ninja. Because it needs to be seen to be believed. You know, if you can see it, because you know, ninja. My words truly can't do it justice. You need to witness and experience this with your own three eyes. If I said it before, I'll say it again. Batman Ninja is batshit crazy. And like a minor character from Cat Dog would say, I love it. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.